Hello and welcome to the programme from me, David Foster. Now, what if you are sick, really unwell, not with COVID-19, but something else, and you are frightened that going to hospital could be worse than living, even just for the time being, with what you have? The hidden health costs caused by the coronavirus. This is Roundtable. Heart conditions, cancer treatment, strokes, it is a long list. In the UK, visits to accident and emergency departments have halved. It's not just people worried about seeking treatment. There are concerns that it could take months for hospitals to once again be able to offer the kind of treatment they did before this pandemic. Stay at home to protect the NHS and save lives. A strong message that has changed the dynamic of health services in the UK. As in other countries, hundreds of thousands of hospital appointments have been cancelled or postponed during the COVID-19 crisis to reduce the pressure on the system and to stop the spread of the virus. But many patients have chosen not to visit their GP or go to emergency departments and that has caused a sharp drop in the number of visitors. A recent report from Cancer Research UK found the number of urgent referrals by family doctors have dropped to about 25% of usual levels. And more than 2,200 new cancer cases could be going undetected each week as the COVID-19 crisis continues. There's concern that other life-threatening conditions could go undiagnosed too, like heart problems or strokes. So how long will it take for health services to return to normal and at what cost to our collective health. Which all sets it up uh, rather nicely, I hope, for a lively conversation. In a short while, we'll be hearing from Helen Bulbeck from the Brain Cancer Charity Brains Trust and the NHS doctor Alex Munster, who works at a cancer centre. But first, let's say hello to Dr Khalid Sadek, family doctor uh, from the Smart Clinic in London and Jacob Lant from the Independent Patients Group Health Watch England. Great to have you both on the programme. Uh, Khalid, let me ask you, first of all, that isn't your normal surgery, is it? You're at home. How different is your day now? Yeah, thank you, David. Well, since uh, the emergence of COVID-19 as a global pandemic from mid-March, the NHS has performed a logistical sea change in how we deliver medical care. And this has really started from the grassroots in primary care and has affected the whole, uh, the, whole, the whole framework up to secondary and tertiary care. If we look at the processes in primary care as a whole, we've gone from the traditional face-to-face -face consultations, which has been around for several hundred years, I'd imagine, to now a much more tech-facing um, interface where patients are treated over a telephone consultation or increasingly more so over video consultation, we're able to carry out um, conversation in much the same way we're doing, um, but having to not be able to touch the patient physically, uh, and that has presented its own challenges. We'll go into some specifics in a moment, but um, are they getting the care that they need, do you think, in general? I think this is uncharted territory, and the NHS is continuing to provide care but in a somewhat restructured format. We know that the focus has been to try and reduce the burden of the peak of COVID-19 on hospitals and primary care. And to do that, we've had to restructure, redeploy, and refocus our resources onto COVID-19. And unfortunately, that has meant the expense of non-COVID-19 cases being affected. Um, and as Prof uh, Witte said in his opening statements about the effects of COVID-19, there will be complications as a result of the virus and there'll be complications indirectly related to the virus. By, cases, by complications, do you mean perhaps deaths? Uh, complications can mean, you know, mortality or morbidity. It could be a delay in diagnosis. It could be the delay in the relief of symptom control. Uh, in the worst case, obviously, that would be more mortality. But there is this um, uncharted morbidity that we, uh, we are yet to determine the scale of. Yeah, because there are 30% of GPs, family doctors, say they've had an urgent referral rejected during this pandemic. I wonder if you've had to reject one or had one rejected for a patient you think desperately needs uh, to see a specialist uh, and, and whether that might be life-threatening. 
Yeah, I mean, what we've seen is that the secondary care setup has changed. So anything which we would have routinely sent over to the hospitals, such as elective surgery, elective consultations with a cardiologist or a gastroenterologist, what we've seen is that those specific physicians have actually been retrained and redeployed. Their elective clinics have been, in effect, um, sequestered to provide for COVID-19 patients. So have you had a As referral refused? We have seen that the elective um, pathways have been reduced or delayed. And what, what so about for serious cases then? The two, we have um, two pathways in effect for primary care access to secondary care. The more serious cases go on what we call a two-week wait pathway. So any suspected cancers will be referred down this two-week pathway. We've seen the services for that particular pathway have remained open. However, there have been additional criteria that have been added so that there is an extra layer of protection in reducing the, 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 the burden. For instance, we've seen the introduction of specific tests for bowel cancer, which have been expedited. We had been planning to roll them out over the course of a year, but in the interest so of COVID-19. It's tougher. it's tougher for you to send a patient who you think may have a serious condition to, to a specialist. I'll come back to you, Khaled, on this, but I want to bring Jacob in at this point. Uh, how many appointments at general surgeries have been cancelled, do you think, as a result of COVID? So there are estimates at the moment that the, the measures the NHS took to um, postpone um, sort of routine surgery freed up about 12,000 beds um, across the NHS to help deal with the surge in capacity um, needed for, for COVID cases. Um, the knock-on effect of that is uh, anywhere estimates of about 2 million um, appointments and surgeries um, postponed or delayed as a result um, of that. So, I mean, that's obviously a huge number of cases. It is worth stating, as Dr. Callender was mentioning, I think still about 30% of surgery has still gone ahead, and that's been the sort of the emergency and urgent cases that have been uh, talked about. What about this will... two-week wait that Dr. Khaled mentioned? So, I mean, the, I think the, the larger issue there is actually the success of the NHS's and the government's message about um, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives, has been hugely successful at actually encouraging people not to put an additional burden on the NHS at this time. So for the two-week wait, I think actually a bigger challenge is, is patients aren't coming forward with the symptoms to get the referrals in the first place. And one of the big messages that's now trying to, we're trying to uh, mobilise is that the NHS is open for business and people should come forward yeah. with symptoms. You see, the problem but, here is that um, while it's taken the pressure off the NHS and freed up critical care beds, these are people who could be seriously ill, who are delaying treatment. I'm just going to read you something from Deb Lowe, in charge of clinical director for stroke at NHS England. She says, uh, that's our big worry, that we're going to see a big burden post-COVID of people that have had common minor strokes or moderate strokes that never presented to healthcare professionals uh, for whatever reason, whether they don't think it's that serious enough and it could be, or whether in fact they're worried about going to hospitals. Uh, Jacob, you first, and then on to you, Khaled, for that one. Uh, precisely. I think those two things both play a factor. So we know from everything that we're hearing from patients across the country that they are worried about putting additional burden on the NHS at this time. But we also know that they're worried about if they attend services, that they run the risk of catching COVID themselves. Um, so there have been, uh, I think the, the most important thing is actually to stress now that, um, as Deb Lowe was saying, we need people to come forward if they've had symptoms. They need to know it's OK to do that. The message about not using the NHS to, to save lives and keep it safe, that was not designed to stop people coming forward with medical concerns. So we need those people to come forward and mm. speak to their GPs and make sure that they are getting the referrals that they need. Kyle, I know you're particular interests are diabetes and heart disease. So figures I got from New York, four times the number of house calls. In other words, people didn't go to A&E, they, they instructed or asked for a doctor to come to them uh, compared to the same period 2019. Of those calls, 1,400 people could not be revived. This is particularly heart attacks. That is up eightfold from last year. Another doctor saying cases of gangrene coming to him are so severe that he has to do amputations. Uh, there's something going wrong somewhere, isn't there? It's a two-pronged approach. We've got, on the one side, trying to keep the burden reduced on the NHS and not over flood it, so to speak. But on the same time, we don't want to be too zealous with our message. There is a, an inherent anxiety associated with COVID-19. 
for both the patients and the medical staff. But it is absolutely imperative that patients who do need emergency care can attend emergency services and the any &E departments are working and ready to accept them. However, maybe the message was, was overly done, but the emergency services are still available. So cases such as heart attacks, um, limbs that are avascular or gangrenous can still seek surgical operations in the A&E department. They are still functioning. It, 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 so, what I'm trying to work out is, is this something we just have to accept? After Ebola, I think in Guinea, uh, for example, in West Africa, it's estimated that there were an extra 10,500 deaths uh, that were caused by lack of routine care. Is it just something we have to say, um, Khalid, and then, then you, Jacob, uh, that's life or not? I think this is a, a, a catastrophic pandemic that's, that struck the globe and invariably will have an impact on the delivery of healthcare for the nation. Uh, and that would mean the reduction of routine access to cases which we would have seen, we would have treated earlier. And so we have to, on balance, say we have to focus on reducing the the burden and, and preventing the collapse of the NHS, but at the same time, keeping the doors open for those acute presentations. Our services are reduced, but we are still open for business. And, and you on that point, uh, Jacob, let, t tell me, what do you think? Do you think patients are prepared to put up with this? I mean, I don't know whether they have much I, choice. I think for the initial response to COVID um, from the first few weeks, month or so, um, it's inevitable that actually there will be a, a significant knock-on effect on patients who were requiring treatment and support for non-COVID related uh, health concerns. The point about whether patients should put up with that long term, obviously, I don't think that is acceptable, but we need to work together, patients and the NHS, to ensure that everyone gets the care that they need. And part of that is um, as we move into the next stage of, uh, of, the, of the pandemic and how we manage it, is ensuring that the NHS is communicating and engaging with patients to make sure that if you've got serious concerns, you are coming to accessing services and you can get the help that you need when they restart waiting lists, that they do it properly and they do it in consultation with patients and they make sure that they're taking uh, um, taking notice of people's symptoms who may, may have changed over the last couple of weeks so that we're addressing the most urgent cases. And that we also- Jacob, thank you very much. I've got, I've got to move on to a final question to, to Dr. Khalid on this one. When I said Guinea, it was actually Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone, but 10 and a half thousand um, extra deaths. First of all, I want to ask you, um, how long do you think it might be before service as normal can be resumed? And, and secondly, whether you think you can properly do your job under these circumstances? I think, uh, so for the first part, the roadmap out of this is still uh, being drafted uh, both nationally for the general public, but also for the NHS. And this will depend on the prevalence of new cases and the burden of ITU beds in the NHS at any given moment in time. We are seeing that we are going past the peak and we will hope to see services start to kicking over the next couple of weeks. In fact, by June, end of June, we should even be having elective surgeries back on. Um, what is to happen come the winter? Is there going to be a second wave? That's still uncharted territory and we'll have to see how that goes. I think the development of a vaccine and development of specific sensitive antibody testing to provide uh, some sort of passport. Which, which with respect, we, we have heard so many times. I just want to ask you, pin you down on this because we're short of time. Um, can you do your job properly? We are, I think everybody is doing their job under uncharted territory. We've developed new technical um, services. We've got apps, we've got video conferencing, we've got tracing apps, we've got a lot of mobile work going on. We have um, hot hubs where patients with COVID-19 symptoms can go and be treated. We have cold hubs where patients who are symptom-free can go and attend. We've got accelerated services. But Khaled, I'm, I'm sorry to keep pushing you on this. The, the point is, can you give patients the treatment at the moment that you think they deserve? Yes or no? I think we're providing the service that we can provide at this given moment in time. Uh, given the pandemic, I think the service is still at a high level from the primary care point of view. We're still continuing to do our reviews on asthmatics, diabetics, mental health and cardiovascular patients. That hasn't stopped. We're continuing to do all of our routine work. The only difference is you might not be able to see physically your doctor as you previously would have done in the short term.
Well, if that is the only difference, uh, then you're doing a great job as uh, all health care professionals are. We appreciate everything you do. Uh, thank you, Khaled, and also thank you very much to you, Jacob. I know you're waiting for feedback from the people you represent, patients right the way across the country, and then you'll put that to the health services uh, as and when you think the time is right. So both of you, thank you very much for coming thank on you. this round table. Thank you so much. Now, in this part of the programme, I can talk to Helen Fulbeck, Director of Services at Brains Trust, a brain cancer charity. And we welcome back to Roundtable Dr. Alex Munster, who's working at a cancer centre here in the UK. Great to have you both on. Alex, let me talk to you first of all about cancer screenings, down by 200,000, perhaps even more. Uh, that's a major concern, surely. Uh, it is. It's a, it's a huge concern. Uh, if we look across the, the UK, uh, as a whole, uh, cancer screening services have been formally paused uh, in Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland, and they've been essentially paused uh, in England with uh, invitation letters no longer being sent out. And as you quote the statistic, there's 200,000 screening tests not being conducted every week uh, for the major cancers that we screen for, so bowel cancer, cervical cancer, uh, and uh, breast cancers. Obviously, this is a huge concern. There's a number of knock-on effects to this, not only missed diagnoses, uh, but delayed diagnoses, which obviously has an impact on the prognosis of these patients who are eventually treated. Um, and there's obviously anxiety around unexplained symptoms that these patients will be having, uh, uh, which, which are not being investigated. And for some of them, I suppose the delay could mean that it's, it's too late. It's difficult to say, but yeah, I think that's a you know sensible conclusion. Um, if, if we don't if we don't screen, obviously, uh, screening is not a diagnosis. It just picks up signs which then need to be subsequently investigated. But yes, if we if if we are missing uh, or, or delaying these these screening tests, there will be uh, inevitable morbidity or mortality associated with that. Helen, um, good news is that um, you've had cancer and survived. Your daughter's had cancer and survived, and that is why you founded Brains Trust. So you, you take a look at the bigger picture here. Uh, what, what do you see at the moment? So um, I see a huge fear for people actually going into hospital or contacting their GP. They either think the services are overwhelmed and too busy or else they're fearful of, of catching coronavirus. We're very fortunate that every week we have updates from the National Cancer uh, Programme Lead and the National Cancer Clinical Director. And we, we know um, that the two-week wait referrals dropped down to by 75%. Um, they're now back up to about 50% pre-COVID levels. And that's been helped by the Help Us Help You campaign from the NHS. But I, you know, I think there's a message here that everybody needs to share. And, and that's about just be mindful of your symptoms and if you have any anxiety at all then your first protocol has to be your gp uh we okay, know so, so you that... you have you sorry to butt in but, but you you have screenings you have referrals to a specialist and if necessary then there follows surgery which can be life-saving in some cases yeah uh, what do you know about um, the delays to um, that that sort of treatment so the COVID-free centres, the cancer hubs, um, they're really focusing on cancer surgery at the moment. So they are now clearing the backlog, but it's very patchy. It's not one size fits all. You know, there's a complexity of layers here, um, such as geographical location, variation, access to primary care, the type of cancer, screening, for example, for brain tumour. There is no screening for brain tumour because there is no treatment, the curative treatment for the highly aggressive ones. So to screen really wouldn't be any good anyway. You just have a lot of people presenting with incidental findings, which maybe they weren't aware of. Um, but certainly, you know, steps are being taken. We know that CT scanners might be involved for um, screening for, for bowel instead of colonoscopy. So there is provision being made for this. And I, I think generally the feeling is that a three month delay is tenable, anything longer than that. And then there's a real concern. Well, let me read you this from Harlan Krumholtz, a cardiologist at Yale University School of Medicine. If fear of the pandemic leads people to delay or avoid care, then the death rate will extend far beyond those directly infected by the virus. These deaths may not be labelled COVID-19 deaths, but surely they are collateral damage. A terrible phrase, Alex, but uh, collateral damage to be expected? It's very hard uh, to accept. Um, 
so often we see the statistics going around of COVID cases and, and, and COVID mortalities. Um, but, you know, I think we, we forget to see the hidden suffering uh, behind the statistics, um, in particular for those patients with chronic diseases and uh, chronic illnesses such as cancer. So it's, it's, it's unavoidable and it's uh, terrible. Um, and, and we all really hope that, you know, we get back to some yeah. sort of sense of normality and, and start to treat these patients as, as they need. But I, I wonder as somebody on the ground, whether you and your colleagues think it is entirely unavoidable. We're not just talking about cancer here. We're talking about heart disease. We're talking about diabetes. We're talking about hypertension. We're talking about a great many different conditions, mm. but unavoidable in pretty much every case because of what we see. It's, it's difficult because it's a balance of risk. So in particular, where I work, you know, we treat patients with cancer who, by virtue of their cancer or the treatment they're receiving, have compromised immune systems. So if you were to continue as, as normal with your treatments, with your radiotherapy and chemotherapy, you know, you could, but you pose a huge risk to these patients in an infectious pandemic. So in that sense, it is unavoidable. We do have to scale back and, and weigh the risk of wanting to help with, with cancer treatments uh, against uh, the risk that they would catch an infection and, 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 and it would and be that's stressful for you as a caregiver, you and your colleagues as well, isn't it? It is. I think there is a obvious psychological burden faced by patients with cancer and other chronic illnesses during this pandemic. Um, but there's also, I think, a, a, a sort of a, a mental burden faced by the NHS staff and caregivers who have to decide uh, about how treatment will be delivered, uh, how it will be modified, whether it will be delivered at all. So I think that that's something that we, we struggle with, and, and particularly when you try to talk to patients uh, in clinic, that's all now, as we hear in, in primary practice, is, is conducted over the phone. So that's very difficult when you have to give news about treatment or, or reassure patients or, or, or you know, show, show empathy and, and show that you care. So I think there is a sort of mental burden faced by caregivers uh, also. Helen, because you've gone through this, you, you know all the associated um, stresses that come with being a, a cancer uh, su sufferer and first, and in your case, to be a, a survivor. It's lack of physical activity. It is a rise in stress levels. It's changes in diet, et cetera, et cetera. How can you make sure that people who don't get the immediate treatment they need do not necessarily worsen because of things that they do to themselves? So I think there's um, a huge role for all the, the health charities here. You know, we've we've put all of our support services online. So we roll out webinars and how to deal with uncertainty, um, how to deal with the overwhelm. We have just run one on managing behavior and personality change, because obviously living with a brain tumor causes all sorts of issues to do with identity and managing behavior. Um, so there is a, and this is the human cost that sits sits behind this. But I think, too, there's a role to play in managing people's expectations. And, you know, I can honestly say that we've not had any of our brain, ca brain cancer patients who most of whom will be on chemotherapy have railed against the NHS. As soon as you explain to them the element of risk that, it, you know, it's the risk factors around getting COVID or con continue with their chemotherapy, they understand it and they're very accepting of this. I think where they have struggled is where um, at the end of life, when they've not been able to be with their loved one, or you know, we've got people in a palliative care ward and their, their husbands, their partners can't go and visit them, or even just going for an MRI scan when you're cognitively impaired. I was talking to a lady today whose husband went for his MRI scan to get and to get the results, and she wasn't allowed in with him, but he has memory problems. You know, so it's working strategies so you can have workarounds to deal with those the human side of this pandemic and those challenges that it's brought that very often aren't the things that come into the limelight. It's the data around, oh, so many people haven't had chemotherapy, so many people have had their diagnostic tests delayed or they're not getting their scans. But it's really important to keep the human element at, at the forefront of our minds too. I, no, I get, I get that. Um, thank you very much indeed. Alex, just one final question. If somebody has to go to hospital for life-saving treatment for anything other than COVID-19. Um, you obviously understand their concerns about being exposed to the risk, but would you say largely it's safe or, or not? 
if you, if you require urgent uh, life-saving treatment, then obviously you, you must go to hospital. That is, that is a recommendation uh, uh, nationally. So it's, it's, uh, hospitals are really doing their best uh, to manage this pandemic and, and manage and mitigate risk. Uh, particularly with uh, new, newly presenting patients coming to hospital. So people should not be put off um, seeking emergency health care if they need it. Listen, thank you both very, very much indeed. In these difficult times, it's good to hear um, particular cases um, of you and your daughter. Uh, and Alex, thank you very much indeed. Still in the front line, but uh, saying it's as safe as it can be under the circumstances, I suppose. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much indeed for watching this edition of Roundtable. From me, David Foster, and the team that made this program possible, we hope to have your company next time. Until then, stay well and stay with us if you can. <laughs>